To begin this last part of the video essay, I'm going to begin by talking about one of the worst deals I've ever made in my entire adult life, and then for whatever it's worth, my personal cope. As I've mentioned in previous videos, during high school I was competitively involved in the game Magic the Gathering. Being lucky enough to get in on the game at the ground level, by the time I finished high school and eventually put the game away, I had a fairly impressive collection. Not really wanting anything more to do with the game, I put the cards away for almost a decade, until later, in my mid-twenties, when perusing a local game shop for a new Euro game, I happened to come across a price list for Magic the Gathering cards, and I was shocked. Cards that were worth tens of dollars when I remembered playing the game were now worth hundreds. And that didn't even seem possible, not for a tiny piece of cardboard at least. How could a market this high for playing cards even be sustainable? Thinking that I was in some kind of bizarre market price spike, some type of Amsterdam tulip market bizarro world, I resolved then and there to sell the lion's share of my collection. After all, how could it get any higher? What, are people going to be paying thousands of dollars for a piece of cardboard? I remember walking out of the game shop with an enormous cashier's check, feeling like I was the smartest person in the world. But even at this moment, I wasn't entirely oblivious. I understood that there was a sentimental attachment to these collector's items. I was well aware of all the horror stories of people selling their comic book collections and then not really knowing what they had done with the money. The last thing I wanted was to have this new windfall just dissolve into the air, dissolve into the living expenses that just came along with being a 26-year-old. At once, upon getting the money, I decided that I needed to buy something that had some sentimental value, but that was longer lasting, something that would have class and staying power, and just feel like a better and more adult investment than a series of playing cards. And so, with a good portion of the money I got, I sat down and bought this, a refurbished 19th century violin, built before, could you believe it, the American Civil War. Of course, this was not the highest quality instrument. Despite being old, it was something of a beater, and I already had a much nicer violin from the 20th century that I used for most of my playing, which was predominantly American folk music. Still, I liked the idea of having this violin as an alternate. At the time, I really enjoyed attending music festivals and old-time festivals where people camped and played in the evenings, and it was nice to have a marginally less expensive instrument that I could take to those gatherings, especially since its age made it so much of a conversation piece. The instrument was beautiful, for lack of a better word, and as I packed it up and took it home, I felt that there was no way that I would ever regret this deal. Well, wouldn't you know it. Fast forward seven or eight years, and financially, this deal was terrible. Those vintage Magic the Gathering cards, the ones worth hundreds that I never thought could be worth thousands, well, it turns out that they are worth thousands now, an appreciation on these cards well above 600%. And, in case you're wondering, there has been no such similar appreciation on antique, low-grade instruments, least of all old violins from the early 19th century. And while I do thoroughly enjoy having an alternative violin, post-grad school and post-family, big expeditions to folk festivals weren't really a thing for me anymore. Whereas the Magic the Gathering collection I had sold to obtain the violin, if liquidated at current market prices, probably would have covered a significant portion of the down payment on my house. In any objective terms, this was a bad deal. But before I go ahead and kick myself too hard for all the money I could have made, I will say this, I don't actually regret the exchange. Of course, there's the raw financial difference that at this stage is quite hard to ignore, but in another sense, in another objective sense, I think it's just nicer to own the old violin than a set of Magic the Gathering playing cards. I know this sounds like a cope, and in some ways it kind of is, but it also gets to an emotion that I'm trying to put into words an expression about the quality of the violin, and the quality of its alternative. It's not simply that the violin is beautiful, which it certainly is. It's not even that I have sentimental attachment to the violin. From a strictly autobiographical point of view, I had more attachment to the cards. Still, while the Magic the Gathering cards might have reflected more of myself, more of my past life, I think the violin reflects more of humanity, more of the world in general. 
more of a beauty beyond my own personality. The Magic the Gathering playing cards were certainly for me nostalgic, and that's certainly why they sold for so much money. But the violin, despite its low price tag, is something more. The violin is cozy. At the beginning of this series, we started with the problem of nostalgia, and in particular, identities built around nostalgia. The problem that seemed to dwell at the heart of nostalgia was the recursive and inward-looking nature of the entire affair. We like these products because we consume them in our childhood, we consume them in our youth, and therefore they give our lives a sense of meaning, strictly for autobiographical reasons. Many times, nostalgia doesn't point to anything of greater truth or goodness, because that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be self-referentially valid. Good not because it tells or alludes to a greater story, but because imbuing it with a mythical quality will vicariously imbue your own life with mythical meaning. Here, obviously, we could talk about Jeremy and my own affinity for Magic the Gathering, but we could also point to Thought Slime's own affinity for bad horror movies and cheap Power Ranger knockoffs. In fact, most of the cultural content you experience in YouTube is built on just this kind of self-referential narcissism. I probably don't have to harken back to Nostalgia Critic, Nostalgic Chick, and That Guy with the Glasses. Half of the fun of watching a Noah Antweiler or a Doug Walker was remembering how bad the product you used to consume was, and still feeling kind of good about consuming it. It was being made part of a story, and part of a story that only you could really interact with. This is a mode that our generation in particular feels very comfortable with, and very comfortable repeating again and again and again. It seems to trap the modern mind in a repeating mode, in what leftists like to call capitalist realism, and what rightists like to call modernity. We see it everywhere, from the 1980s motifs that are so common and popular on the right, to the 1970s camp and kitsch aesthetics that are favored by the left. And I'm not immune to this emotion. I'm not immune to this cultural reality at all. It does seem like we're living in a world that's an echo of another one. I remember recently watching a movie Ford vs. Ferrari with my wife. Being sort of a sucker myself for engineering movies, I thought it would be a good opportunity to leave the politics that seems inserted in all Hollywood movies these days and just go in for some car racing adventure fun. But when I watched the movie, I found myself less engrossed in the cars and more just fascinated by the world of America in the 1960s, of Michigan in the 1960s. Michigan is not a state that I feel unfamiliar with, but watching a snapshot of the era, even interpreted through the eyes of Hollywood, one sees a world that has more optimism, that has a sense of where it's going, and you can't help not wanting to go back to that place and to find something of the direction and meaning those characters and indeed all of America seem to have. Now this is more romanticism than nostalgia on my part. I never lived through the 60s, but all the while experiencing this emotion, I'm tempted to return to and set up similar self-affirming and self-referential mythical narratives about the 90s and early 2000s. They did seem like more innocent times, and there is something there that it feels like we're missing now. I don't say this to be morose or melancholic, but simply to demonstrate the driving force behind our desire for nostalgia and to construct artificial mythological consumer identities out of the things we consumed in times past. Probably such an introduction wasn't entirely necessary. It doesn't take a genius to say that the person who tries to construct an identity out of consuming B-movies and playing consumer card games is obviously grappling for some kind of identity and narrative of his own life that previous generations would have gotten from deeper and more eternal sources. But in order to confront the problem of nostalgia, we need to understand that the issue is not the consumer items themselves, but rather the absence that inspires devotion to them. We live in an age that is singularly without quality. As Gertrude Stein might put it, there is no there there, or as we might adjust it, there is no here here. In the 2020s, we're all disconnected, 
we're all disassociated from the place that we're supposed to be from and the lives that we're supposed to be living. But if that's the case, if there is this absence, if we have in fact lost this key element of human life, how do we recover it? How do we find authenticity again? The classic answer, at least in the 1990s, was to try to find a more authentic place. Sure, America might be stale. Sure, you might not have a consistent identity handed down to you from your parents that you really respect. But certainly, this can be found abroad in more authentic and more ancient cultures. However, in the 21st century, I think this strategy is well and truly worn out. There is that common, horrible modern experience, felt particularly keenly by Californians, when one journeys to a distant place, only to find it rapidly globalizing, rapidly homogenizing to the same common American and Western notion of a spiritless, consumer-centered culture. We might always have Paris, we might always have London, but their existence, at least if they continue this trajectory, is to be Xerox copies of Portland and Seattle. Certainly, I think, at this point, it's obvious that if people want respite from the modern condition, if people want an alternative way of living, they're going to have to think smaller and look inward before they look to foreign and far-off places. Developing an authentic and thick-feeling culture begins in our own culture that we consume. Developing a notion of oikos begins, ironically enough, at home. In order to start building a more authentic place, a more authentic environment, we need a direction that everyone has access to. Not some intellectual theory, and certainly not a political movement, but rather more of an aesthetic. After all, nostalgia itself, the concept we are trying to address is an aesthetic. And if nostalgia is showing signs of being weak and hollow and unhealthy, what indeed is the alternative? Is there a healthier aesthetic way to consume culture that gets beyond nostalgia? Is there a healthier way that we can consume and interact with culture, even in a very basic and non-intellectual way? Indeed, I believe there is. And the aesthetic temperament that I think can really replace nostalgia is the term and feeling, popularized by internet and meme association, of being cozy. Now, in the wake of a periodic self-examination on the part of the distant right, this concept of cozy has come up in discussion among a variety of thinkers, and I felt that it deserved more thought and rumination, especially with regards to our own relationship to nostalgia. Probably most people at this stage are looking for a formal definition of this concept, something that I'd likely include in a video about language, politics, or philosophy. But this is not really the case with the concept of cozy. It's not a concept in politics, it's an aesthetic. Cozy is a deep emotion, a wholesome one. Like nostalgia, it typically applies to places and things that are older, although it doesn't have to. And like nostalgia, the feeling of cozy is also comfortable and reassuring, but in an entirely different way. Cozy is an object, perhaps one you've never used, that you know you can rely on, and that promises mastery with discipline. Cozy is a place, perhaps one you've been to, or perhaps one you've never seen before in your entire life, that feels like if you stayed there, if you studied it, you would learn something, and you would grow. Cozy is an experience you've either had or haven't, that you know has, or possibly would, make your life feel meaningful, even if only temporarily. Cozy is walking into a massive and ancient library in a university you've only just visited, and wondering how much you could learn if you had a lifetime to spend there. Cozy is gazing at the stars on a summer evening, fishing off a boat in a summer day, or even worshipping in a wayside chapel, and wondering who worshipped there before. And it doesn't even matter if you've never had these experiences. I haven't had every one of them. But we can recognize them as cozy, and it applies to objects too. Cozy is the well-read and well-loved book, perhaps with a creased spine. Cozy is a children's story like Goodnight Moon that doesn't even seem to have a time associated with it. Cozy are games like chess and cribbage and bridge. The games that when you play them, you feel like you're speaking some kind of ancient language. You're holding communion with other players and perhaps even practicing an ancient art. Cozy is walking through an art gallery, seeing a picture you never knew existed by a painter you never heard of, and then wondering why the picture is there and what it meant to communicate. 
Cozy is turning the final page on a book you always meant to read and realizing that you've done it, even if you didn't like the book itself. And sure enough, perhaps listing off associations and emotions I have with this word cozy is vague and inexact. It's intentionally meant to be that. Certainly through all these experiences, there are some common words we could associate with cozy. Old might be one, although not all old things are cozy, and many new things aspire to be. Another word might be wholesome, which to my own mind is certainly a quality of all things cozy, but doesn't go quite so far as to capture the feeling I'm trying to evoke. Finally, one might just say that cozy is quality, but to be honest, cozy is not just quality, it's a particular kind of quality. Again, I think the emotion and the aesthetic is going to resist formal description, and for this my viewers will have to forgive me. I'm not trying to form a philosophical syllogism around the notion of cozy, but I am here trying to create a central contrast for all of the adjectives and events and objects we associated with the word cozy. I would argue that in all cases, that which is properly described as cozy is in no way nostalgic, at least in the ordinary way we talk about nostalgia online, on YouTube, at least in the way that nostalgia has such a large role to play in YouTube channels like Thought Slime and The Quartering. And as vague as these two words are, nostalgia and cozy, I think we can draw a quite clear contrast between the two of them. Nostalgia is stimulating, while cozy is nourishing. Nostalgia is inward-facing, whereas cozy is outward-facing. Nostalgia and content occupies no particular time and place, yet its appeal to those who enjoy it is based entirely on when and where it was consumed. By contrast, the content of a cozy object or experience is absolutely situated in a certain time, in a certain place, and yet its appeal seems timeless. Nostalgia is that which we keep to ourselves because it tells us something about ourselves, but cozy is that which we want to share and bring forward to friends and even future generations because we think it makes the world a better place. And most important of all, while nostalgia thrives off of times and places, built already in mythological association, the experience of the cozy, the experience of that which is worthy of cozy, makes a time and place into its own mythology. And here, as I end this cursory list of contrasts, listeners might also recognize a more temporal contrast between nostalgia and cozy. Our generation, the men and women who have come of age in the 21st century, have many more nostalgic experiences than any humans who have ever lived before us, and very many fewer cozy experiences. To me, I can't help but think that this says something. I can't help but feel that this points to something that was definitively lost, and to some solution, some way of recovering by realizing how it could be fixed. Now, of course, before I get carried away with myself, this isn't some grand philosophical theory. This isn't some magnificent political plan. This is simply an aesthetic, and it's not the only aesthetic that the right wing needs either. For all of the wholesome experiences, the evocative and restorative messages that we need to communicate, there is also the need for contrasting forces. Forces of transgression and egression, of chance and disruption, all of which the cozy aesthetic certainly does not reflect. But through all of this, I think that the aesthetic of cozy is what the right really needs to carry forward in this particular moment. In this particular situation we find ourselves in this year of our Lord 2020, it's what feels to be really missing. And I can anticipate objections from more practically minded people. So you're pointing out problems in modern culture, in modern nostalgia oriented media, in modern nostalgia oriented content creators on YouTube, and your solution is cozy? An aesthetic concept? How is anyone supposed to use that for anything? And this is certainly an excellent question. On some superficial level, I could say you're not supposed to use aesthetics in a utilitarian sense. But on the other hand, knowing that something is out there and knowing that you want it can be quite useful. Desire is the first step to seeking something and seeking is the penultimate step to finding it. For all the time we spend on the dopamine treadmill of nostalgia, trying to get back to those old experiences that gave our life meaning in some other time, 
might we not also grasp for something deeper, something more substantial, something more life-giving even in our consumption choices? Perhaps trying to pick up and finish that book you always wanted to read instead of binge-watching an old show on Netflix. Perhaps trying your hand at an instrument instead of a video game. And for those more ambitious creators out there, there is always the Herculean task of making that which is modern, that which is new, something that is worthy of being cozy. Transforming a product's appeal to something that is momentary and consumeristic towards something that's more artistic and timeless. Now I'm uncertain whether you could ever transform something like Magic the Gathering into being something as cozy as a game like chess. But I haven't wondered if modern nerd culture couldn't find redemption in another iteration under the caring stewardship of people who believe that it means something and points to something larger than themselves. For my own part, cozy is the aesthetic that I want my channel and my online presence to have for as long as I can maintain it. Always, I feel, inside the surface level aesthetic of coziness is an implicit promise that what you're consuming and what you're doing isn't simply entertainment, isn't simply just a never-ending task to get dopamine hits. Within aesthetics, there are inspirations, there are promises, however subjective that statement might be. To return quite briefly to my own example, my possession of an old violin, purchased ultimately for much more money than it's actually worth, I see here that the value of the object of the violin is not so much in its use, but in its promise. A promise that insofar as my own life goes, I should be more dedicated to those pastimes and those arts that are outwardly focused, that aspire to greater things, like music and beauty, and not simply self-indulgence. It may be wild speculation on my part, but it is my sincere belief that if the right as a movement pursues this aesthetic, pursues this promise, it will bear fruit. If we focus on those objects and experiences that seem to contain more meaning, and focus on highlighting their importance, there is much to be gained. And not simply because of an absence on the left, not simply because progressive society has seemed to have lost the ability to pursue these things, but more so because we might create something, in the process that is beautiful and lasting in its own right. I realize this more and more as the years go by and in particular this year. As you cross milestones in your life, you come to the realization that you're not young anymore. Not young in any way or in any sense. Any pretension to be young would just be a lie. And that puts things in a different perspective. Because implicit in any identity that is not itself young is the question about what you're going to give to the future. What are you going to hand down? And no one really wants to hand down their nostalgia. No one really wants to hand down a catalog of bad habits and meaningless consumption. We want to pass on something more thick, more real, more life-giving. Thinking this way is really the curse of all mortals, but in another sense it's also our salvation. It forces us to think bigger. Finishing out a video series that started as a critique of several other much larger and much more successful YouTubers, I'm tempted to transpose these existential observations from my personal life to my digital one. Ultimately, no one knows the true value of a YouTube channel, and certainly the answer to the question of what my channel might deliver ultimately is more up to my audience to provide than myself. However, for whatever good this channel provides to the many fewer people who watch it, I have sometimes fancied that the digital mortality presented by the online censorship of right-wing channels may in fact be an opportunity. I can confidently say that Thought Slime's channel will last for as long as its creator wants. It has a certain kind of immortality that you usually associate with left-wing projects online. And for all his anti-woke rabble-rousing, I would guess that Jeremy from the Quartering is in no imminent threat of censorship. He hasn't crossed any of those lines that would mark him as a dangerous right-wing dissident. And in all probability, both of these content creators, for as much as they hate each other, will continue on and on and on, critiquing nostalgic products from different sides. But the same can't be said for right-wing channels. The time frame for these products is limited. 
even my own channel, which is far from edgy when it comes to dissident right content, I have to admit that the banhammer is probably somewhere in my future. How long is it going to be? Four years? One year? Six months? And with that time frame in mind, your priorities change. How is one going to use their platform to the best possible end? Immortals can afford to mess around with trivialities that don't ultimately live there, but those who are immortal have to make it count. And herein really lies the essential nature of the cozy aesthetic. It is that which is worthy for other people. It is that which is worthy for future generations. And when we deal with ideas that are worthy, when we deal with concepts that are worthy, even when we deal with vague aesthetics that are worthy, we are doing something much more powerful and much more meaningful than simply restructuring a narrative that is ultimately just about ourselves. Again, I don't think I'm qualified to say if I have done this looking back on my own work, but I can say that I'll endeavor to do such going forward, and this, I think, is as much as any critical examination of the past can reasonably be asked to do.